Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing grocery outlet stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Grocery outlet is a chain of discount supermarkets that offers discounted, overstocked and closed out products from name brands and private labels. The company is headquartered in Emeryville, California and was founded in 1946. It went public in 2019 and currently trades on the NASDAQ. The company has stores in California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Nevada, and Pennsylvania. 375 of its 380 stores are independently owned, mostly by married couples. And the company uses something similar to a franchise model. Each store has flexibility in its product offerings to serve local tastes and demand. The stores also carry staples such as fresh meat, dairy, and bread. The company's formal name is Grocery Outlet Bark and Market. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 3.5 billion market cap. They're trading at $37 a share and they have 95 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flows cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company has positive free cash flow but it's pretty small between 11 and 50 million dollars a year. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. That's also pretty low, peaking in 2020 at 107 million. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that's been growing a lot from 2 billion up to 3.1 billion. COVID has really helped this company because people are not eating out as much as they were and going to discount chains like this. You can see their margins are pretty low as most grocery stores are, 1%, but it jumped way up to 3% in 2020. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. An example is the cost of labor. The difference between those two numbers is their gross profit. That's growing each year up to $1 billion in 2020. Below that is operating expenses, an example is marketing expense. Below that is operating income, and they broke through $100 million in 2020 for the first time. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt. They paid only $20 million of interest in 2020. It peaked in 2018 at $55 million. Below that is other income and expenses. This is usually impairments or write-offs. Then pre-tax income, then their taxes. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. And that's positive every year, much higher in 2020 at over 100 million. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash. Because net income is your accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. And then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. They had their highest capex in 2020 at 130 million. Operating cash flow minus capex gives you your free cash flow. Free cash flow is the cash flow that's remaining to pay a dividend, to buy back stock, to pay down debt, or to invest back into their business. They don't have that much free cash flow remaining, so they can't buy back stock or pay a dividend. They are paying down debt, but it looks like they're issuing debt to pay down the old debt. And in 2019, when they IPO'd, they received $408 million from the IPO, and they used all that money to pay down debt. Let's look at the capital structure, $900 million of equity, $1.4 billion of debt. They have 40% equity, 60% debt, and their net debt is $1.3 billion. Their WAC is 8.2%. And that's the discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for that's 2.6 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $2.2 billion. We divide that by 95 million shares. 
and we get a calculated stock price of $23. They're trading at $37, so they're trading at a 60% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply, Wall Street's value is $41, so they're saying the stock is undervalued. In the past three months, eight analysts priced this stock. The average price was $43, the low was $35, the high was $50. My stock price is well below the low. You can see the stock IPO'd in 2019, and it's been up and down. It peaked at about $50 a couple of times, but now it's down to $37. It looks like it is up from its IPO price, but not by too much. Their stock has increased 8% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P 500 increased 54%. The 52-week low was 32, the high was 49. And the stock is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. About 1 million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 95 million shares outstanding, 84 million are on float, 95% are held by institutions, and 11% of the shares on float are shorted. In the past 90 days, this stock is down 10%, while the industry is down 1%, and the market is up 4%. In the past year, this stock is up 3%, but the industry is up 27%, and the market is up 60%. This stock is lagging their industry and the market. Analysts are forecasting their earnings to grow about 4%, the industry to grow 10%, and the market to grow 19%. However, analysts are expecting their revenue to grow 8%, the industry 4%, and the market 10%. In the past five years, their earnings grew 58%, while the industry only grew 10%, and the market grew 12%. And if you compare the last year, their earnings grew 566%, while the industry grew 65% and the market only grew 3%. If you invested $10,000 into this company when it IPO'd, you'd be at $13,000 today. That's a 15% annual return. The biggest shareholders are Jackson Square at 10%, then Sands Capital Management, Capital Research, Vanguard, and BlackRock. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average PE in the market's 32, the median is 22, PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 33, which is about the average. That means investors are paying $33 for $1 of earnings. Price to sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 1.1. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 3.8, which is between the median and average. And the way you calculate book value per share is equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in a balance sheet, and they have 900 million of equity, 126 million of tangible equity, because they have 800 million of intangibles on their balance sheet. Their return on invested capital is only 3.6%. The way you calculate that, you take EBIT times 1 minus the tax rate, divided by equity plus net debt, and their WAC is 8.2% which means they're losing 4.7% on each dollar invested. This indicates they should probably not grow and work on becoming more efficient. This also could be a timing thing where possibly next year or the year after, it would look a lot better these numbers. Interest coverage ratios EBIT over interest expense. They're at 5.5, so they can easily cover their interest payments. ROE is net income over equity. They have a 12% ROE which is better than the median and average. Current ratios, current assets over current liabilities, they're at 1.6, so they have a good current ratio. Their current assets are 100 million of cash and 245 million of inventory. So the company does seem to have enough capital to get through the next 12 months without taking on any more debt. They had 50 million of free cash flow, they currently have 149 million working capital, and they don't pay a dividend, so they have 200 million dollars of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on Albertsons, Alimentation Kush, Kroger, Loblaw, Metro, Sprouts, and Weiss. All in the same industry as Grocery Outlet. And if Go has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So they're worse than all the price multiples. They do have a higher current ratio than average. They're much lower in ROE than average, a little higher in debt, and they are one of the smallest companies on this list, and they don't pay a dividend. Most companies do pay a dividend. I don't think this company is going anywhere. They've been around a long time, 
And people are always looking for discounts, especially with food, because they have to buy food every day. But I personally would never buy this stock because I'm so bullish on Costco. I think they have a great business model. This could be a good investment, but I'm just not too comfortable on the way they operate and the way they structure their stores. What I'm referring to is their independent operator business model. I rank their free cash flows 5 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratios 2 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.